Welcome to episode 6 of the Minds of Murderers podcast, your home for factual true crime content focused around trying to highlight the person behind the crime. In this episode, we will look at the Barbie and Ken murderers, Paul Bernardo and Carla Hamolka. Paul Bernardo and Carla Hamolka were a match made in hell. They came together to abduct, sexually torture and murder multiple girls. Let's start with Carla's story. Carla Leanne Hamolka was born May the 4th, 1970, in Port Credit, Ontario, Canada. She was the eldest of three girls. Her younger sisters were Laurie and Tammy Hamolka. The family lived in St. Catharines, Ontario for most of Carla's life. This is where she was raised and went to school. From all accounts, Carla had a typical upbringing. Her parents were both very hardworking, the family was strong, connected and normal. Carla did fairly well in school and worked part-time in a pet shop. After graduating in 1988, she was hired as a veterinary assistant by the Thorold Veterinary Clinic. Sometime later, she took a similar job at the Martindale Animal Clinic. No complaints could be found from her co-workers. For all intents and purposes, she was a good worker. Now that you know a little bit about Carla, let's introduce Paul Bernardo. Paul Bernardo was raised under much, much different circumstances than his future bride. Born Paul Kenneth Bernardo on August 27, 1964 in Canada, his father was convicted of child molestation in 1975 after fondling a young girl. There is no proof that his father ever molested him, but it was proven that he abused his own daughter, Paul's younger sister. His mother was physically there, living in the basement of their Scarborough home, but she was emotionally detached. She distanced herself from the abuse that her husband inflicted on their family. As a child, Paul was described as thus by author Nick Pron of the book Lethal Marriage. He was always happy, a young boy who smiled a lot, and he was so cute with his dimpled good looks and sweet smile. Underneath that sweet smile, however, Paul was becoming increasingly more fascinated with dark sexual fantasies. He began to see women as mere objects that were placed here for his desires. They were less than human. He took great enjoyment in humiliating, beating and demeaning women, especially in public. His attitude towards women worsened when his mother confessed to him, at 16 years old, that he was the result of an affair. From that point on, he frequently insulted his mother for her promiscuous behaviour. He was a harsh and judgmental boy who grew into a malicious man. At this moment, I would like to recap the common traits of a psychopath. Paul Bernardo is displaying many of the warning signs of psychopathy. A lack of empathy, guilt, conscience or remorse. Shallow feelings and or emotions. Impulsivity and inability to control one's behaviour. A grandiose sense of their own worth. Superficial charm. Check, check, check. Yes for Paul. Here at the Minds of Murderers podcast, We are not doctors, we are not psychiatrists, we are not psychologists, we are not trained in the field of mental health. But we have done our own thorough research and feel confident in saying that Paul is a psychopath. In May 1987, Paul began to act on his dark sexual urges. He would stalk women who were riding the bus late at night. His first confirmed victim was a 21 year old woman who he followed from the bus stop to her home. He then raped her in front of her parents house. Paul continued to stalk, attack and rape women under the cover of darkness. He typically stuck to his routine of following women from a bus stop, but on at least one occasion he broke into a 15 year old girl's bedroom. He held her at knife point on her bed, but fled when her mother came into the room and screamed. Unfortunately in this particular case, another man was tried and convicted of the attempted rape, meaning Paul got off scot-free. 19-year-old Anthony Hainmeyer served 16 months for the crime. He was exonerated in 2006 after Bernardo made a full confession. In October 1987, Paul and Carla met at a conference in a Toronto hotel. Carla was still a senior in high school and only 17 years old. Paul was 23. The attraction was instant. They fit together like two demented puzzle pieces. The pair had sex that night and Paul felt invigorated by the fact that Carla encouraged his sadistic tendencies. She later said that Paul used to carry around a copy of Brett Easton Ellis' novel, American Psycho, and read it like it was his bible. 
it is unclear whether or not Carla knew of Paul's role as the Scarborough Rapist. But it would not be a leap to discern that she was at least suspicious of his possible involvement. Some have speculated that she supported his actions, that she encouraged him. This is of course rampant speculation and we have no proof for this. Carla claimed that she was not aware of his actions. The December after Paul and Carla met, he resumed his stalking, rape and assault of women. He would threaten them with a knife and often rape the women in a secluded outside location, such as dark alleyways. One woman fought so furiously that Paul attempted to subdue her by stabbing her in the thigh and buttock. She managed to escape the attempted rape but required 12 stitches. In November 1988, a police task force was assembled to catch the Scarborough Rapist, targeted particularly at women who rode the bus at night to not travel alone. By 1990, Paul was spending a considerable amount of time with the Hamolka family. He appeared to them to be a pleasant and charming young man. What they didn't know though, was that they had lost his job at an accounting firm and was now making money by smuggling cigarettes back and forth across the US-Canadian border. He was also openly flirting with Carla's younger sister Tammy. On top of the flirtatious behaviour, he would peep through her window at night while she slept and masturbate. Carla had intentionally broken the blinds so he could see in. Carla and Paul came to an agreement that she would gift her sister's virginity to Paul as a Christmas present. He had always been upset by the fact that Carla wasn't a virgin when they met. Tammy was only 15 years old. On December 23rd, 1990, the Hamolka family had a family Christmas party in their home. Paul, Carla and Tammy stayed up later than the rest of the family, plying her with halcyon spiked eggnog. Halcyon is a drug used to treat insomnia. With enough in her system, young Tammy would be out cold for a while. Carla had stolen the drugs as well as some halothane from the vet clinic where she worked. Halothane is an inhalation anaesthetic for the induction and maintenance of general anaesthesia. Once Tammy was blacked out, the pair removed her clothing. As an added precaution to prevent Tammy from waking up, Carla held a rag soaked in the halothane up to her sister's face. This resulted in chemical burns being plastered around her nose, mouth and cheek. Paula then raped Tammy. Carla helped, watched and recorded the event. During the assault, Tammy began to vomit and choke. When she subsequently stopped breathing, the abhorrent pair attempted to revive her. They were unsuccessful. Before calling 911, Paul and Carla cleaned up the scene to hide any evidence of their involvement. They did laundry, vacuumed and tucked Tammy into bed. Their intention had been to drug Tammy so she would pass out and not remember the assault. It is believed that she overdosed on the drugs that Carla had spiked her drinks with, as well as the inhalant that had been pressed to her face. Tammy Hamolka was pronounced dead a few hours later at St Catherine's General Hospital without ever regaining consciousness. Her death was determined to be from choking on her own vomit after a mass consumption of alcohol. It was ruled an accident. The chemical burn on her face was never investigated because Cammy's death did not appear suspicious to the coroner. A recording was later discovered showing Carla wearing her sister's clothes and pretending to be her in a sex game with Paul. To give her parents some space to grieve for their youngest daughter, Carla and Paul moved into their own home. They were soon on the prowl for their next victim. Paul had become angry with Carla for allowing Tammy to die. He had wanted to take advantage of her more than once and now she was quote, no longer around for him to enjoy sexually. The plan was to present Paul with another surrogate virgin. Carla had just the girl in mind. Jane Doe was an underage girl that was friends with Carla. She looked up to her and idolised her. The girl's name was never released because she was underage when this attack happened. Carla took the girl out for dinner and repeated the spiked drink plan. She was then invited back to their home and a halothene rag was held up to her face. Once she was unconscious, both Paul and Carla savagely attacked her, filming the entire event so they could go back and relive it over and over together. Unlike Tammy, Jane Doe woke up the next morning. She said she felt very battered, sore and bone tired but she had no memory of what happened to her. 
This assault had bonded the pair like none had before. Paul was excited to have a partner in crime that was just as depraved as he was. He went out on the night of June 15th, 1991 to find their next victim. This was just 14 days before their wedding. 14 year old Leslie Mahaffey was out on the streets that night. Having missed her curfew, she had been locked out of the house. She didn't have a plan of where to sleep and that's when Paul came into the picture. He had been in the neighborhood stealing license plates when he found her. He told her that he was looking to break into one of the houses in the neighborhood and asked her opinion on which one to hit. She wasn't phased and simply asked him for a cigarette. Paul told her that there were some in his car and she followed him. He then shoved her into his car, blindfolded her and took her back to the house where Carla was waiting. Once he brought Leslie in, he announced to Carla that he had a playmate for her. With Bob Marley and David Bowie blaring, Paul and Carla tied Leslie's hands with twine and proceeded to torture her. She was sodomized and thoroughly assaulted by both Paul and Carla. The entire act was recorded. At one point during the assault, Paul told Leslie, you're doing a good job, a damn good job. The next two hours are going to determine what I do to you. Right now, you're scoring perfectly. The original plan had been to release Leslie when they were finished with her, but during the attack her blindfold had slipped. She had seen their faces clearly and would be able to identify them to authorities. They would have to dispose of her to keep their secrets safe. There are two accounts of how Leslie actually died. Paul claimed that Carla fed her a lethal dose of Halcyon, much like she did with her sister Tammy. Carla claimed that Paul strangled her to death. Because of the state of Leslie's remains, it was unclear how she officially died. After Leslie was dead, her body was placed in the basement. Paul and Carla then hosted their family for a pleasant evening dinner. This would become a trend for the devious couple. After they brutalised a young girl, they would have a sort of celebration with friends and family. Of course, they were all clueless as to the horrific act that had just happened in the home they were now guests in. After their guests left, the couple decided to encase Leslie's remains in concrete. They dismembered her and set each piece in its own block of concrete. Paul borrowed a circular saw from his grandfather to dismember the 14-year-old girl. Multiple blocks were made and numerous trips to Lake Gibson to dump them. At least one block weighed approximately 200 pounds or 90 kilograms. This large piece in particular would not sink and ended up resting on the shore. It was discovered by a father-son fishing team on June 29th, 1991. Leslie Mahaffey's body was positively identified by her dental records. Two weeks after their horrific sexual torture and murder, Paul and Carla were married in a fairy tale church wedding. All was quiet for the newlyweds until April 1992. In the late afternoon of the 16th, they went out driving to hunt for their next victim. They did not have a particular girl in mind when they came across high school student Kristen French. She was walking home from school through an empty parking lot. Paul pulled their car beside Kristen and Carla got out to ask her for directions on their map. She said they were lost and needed help. While Kristen was looking at the map, Paul shoved her from behind into the car. Kristen was in the front seat with Carla, sitting behind her, controlling her by pulling her hair. Paul held a knife to threaten her further. When Kristen did not arrive home promptly, as she usually did, her parents began to worry. Kristen was a very reliable young woman who would hurry home after school each day to spend time with her dog. The police were called and within 24 hours, a team was assembled to search by the Niagara Regional Police or NRP. There'd been multiple witnesses to the abduction and one of Kristen's shoes had been found in the parking lot. Over the Easter weekend, Paul and Carla videotaped themselves as they tortured, raped, sodomized, forced alcohol down her throat and forced her into submissive behavior. It was believed later by investigators that they had never intended to release Kristen. At no point had she been blindfolded. After this horrific ordeal, they killed Kristen. Once again, there are two accounts of how she actually died. By Carla's account, Paul strangled her with his bare hands. She claimed to have timed him with a watch. It took seven minutes to strangle Kristen to death. By Paul's account, he claimed that Carla beat her with a rubber mallet and strangled her with a noose. Kristen's naked body was found on April 30th, 1992 in an abandoned area 45 minutes outside of town. 
Her hair had been shaved off and her body had been thoroughly washed. It was originally thought that her hair was taken off as a sort of macabre trophy. But Carla later admitted that they had shaved her head to inhibit identification of the body. Things took an odd turn in the early 90s when Paul and Carla applied to have their surname changed to Teal. They were avid fans of the 1988 movie Criminal Law and wanted to take one of the characters' names. This change was approved in February 13th, 1993. On December 27th, 1992, Carla was aggressively beaten by her husband with a heavy duty flashlight. Her arms, legs, head and face were bruised and bloodied. As it unfortunately typically happens, she attempted to protect her husband. She told everyone who asked that she'd been in a car accident. This is known as battered woman syndrome, which is a subcategory of post-traumatic stress disorder. This typically is a learned behavior from abusive partners. People under these conditions will not report their abuse to police and they won't tell friends and family what's really going on. If you or someone you know might be in a dangerous situation, please follow the link in the show notes for the National Domestic Violence Hotline. Carla's parents were concerned about the injuries and took her to the hospital where they were documented. She gave a false statement to the NRP, claiming to be a battered wife and that she would like to press charges against her husband. Paul was arrested for the assault, but he was soon released. Carla then moved in with relatives, an aunt and an uncle in Brampton. Around the same time, December 1992, the DNA samples that Paul had volunteered to the Scarborough Rapist Task Force were tested. They had been sitting, waiting to be tested since July 1990. Paul was confirmed to be the Scarborough Rapist. He was immediately put on round-the-clock surveillance, but not arrested. The Metro Toronto Sexual Assault Squad came to interview Carla in February 1993. They discussed their concerns about her husband being the Scarborough Rapist. The investigators later said that Carla seemed quite unfazed by the fact that Paul might be a rapist and murderer and only wanted to focus on the abuse that he had done to her. Something that the investigators said must have gotten through to Carla because a few days after the interview, she confessed to her aunt and uncle that Paul was in fact the Scarborough Rapist. She also admitted that she knew about the sexual assault and murders of Leslie and Kristen. She told them that everything was on tape. With Paul having a link to two murders and multiple rapes, the death of Tammy Hamolka was reopened so it could be investigated. On February 17, 1993, Paul was arrested by the Metro Toronto Sexual Assault Squad and Green Ribbon Task Force. Warrants had been issued for their rented home, but there were strict limitations. No evidence that was not expected and already documented was to be removed from the house. All videotapes must be viewed at the house. The only incriminating tape discovered was of Carla performing oral sex on the unconscious Jane Doe. Damage to the house had to be kept at a minimum. Walls could not be turned down to search for evidence. Carpets could not be ripped up. The search lasted 71 days, and in April 1993, after the warrant had expired, Paul told his lawyer where to find the incriminating tapes. There were six tapes hidden behind a light in the bathroom. On May 5th, 1993, the Canadian government offered Carla a plea bargain of a 12-year prison sentence. If she declined, she could be charged with two counts of first-degree murder, one count of second-degree murder, and other crimes. She accepted the offer. On May 14th, she began giving detailed statements to investigators. A publication ban was put out to all media to protect Carla and Paul's right to a fair trial. Authorities were concerned that if too much information, true or false, were leaked to the public, that the trial would not be fair. Of course, this publication ban did not reach across the Canadian-American border. In New York, Michigan and other US states, the story was widespread. News did make its way back to Ontario and rumours began to grow rapidly. One such gruesome rumour was as follows. To keep the victims from escaping, both girls were hobbled by their abductors, who used veterinary surgical instruments to sever tendons in their legs. Of course, this was proven by the medical examiner to be not the case, but rumours can carry heavy weight when people are confronted with horrific crimes such as rape and murder of young girls. Charges were officially pressed on May 18th, 1993. Carla was charged with two counts of manslaughter, 
Paul was charged with two counts of kidnapping, unlawful confinements, aggravated sexual assault, and first degree murder as well as dismemberment. Details of the trial were limited because of the publication ban. No journalists had been allowed in the courtroom during the proceedings. At this point, Paul's lawyer was having ethical concerns about not sharing the incriminating tapes with police and other judicial sources. He was instructed by the Law Society of Upper Canada's Professional Conduct Committee to seal the tapes in a package and turn them over to the presiding judge. He then stepped down as Paul's counsel. The video was not played for the jury during the trial, but the audio was. Paul confessed to raping the women and assaulting them, but said Carla actually killed them. After word of the tape's existence was leaked, the community became outraged with Carla. There was widespread belief that she had more intimate dealings with the crimes than originally thought. The people wanted new charges pressed and the plea deal broken. The press began to have a field day with misleading information and nicknames. They called the couple the demonic duo, claimed they practiced vampirism on their victims, called them the Barbie and Ken murderers, and Killer Carla. Someone in the artistic community created a comic book based on Carla called Carla's Web, which featured her and her, quote, twisted psychology and web of lies. The plea bargain made with Carla would hold strong as long as she promised to uphold her end of the deal. She promised full disclosure and testimony against her husband in return for reduced charges. By playing the role of the accomplice and battered wife, she was able to escape central blame for the rapes and murders of the girls. The community was outraged. The presiding judge over Bernardo's case had this to say, The Crown had no alternative but to negotiate with the accomplice in this case as the lesser of two evils, to deal with the accomplice rather than be left in a situation where a violent and dangerous offender cannot be prosecuted. After Carla's testimony was complete, she was sent to Kingston Prison for Women. Her mother began to suffer from ill health and mental breakdowns. She was frequently hospitalised. Carla was soon moved again to a medium security prison in Joliet, Quebec, which was most commonly known as Club Fed by its critics. This institution was plush compared to the prison she had been in before. Under the highly structured environment, Carla thrived. She was regularly seen by psychologists and psychiatrists who agreed that she showed signs of spousal abuse. But Carla was known to be manipulative, so it was theorised that she did research and took cues on appropriate behaviour from books. Here is a quote from one of the professionals that evaluated her during her incarceration. Carla remained something of a diagnostic mystery. Despite her ability to present herself very well, there is a moral vacuity in her which is difficult, if not impossible, to explain. Carla stayed in contact with her family and they wrote letters back and forth often. She continued to proclaim her innocence that Bernardo had been the mastermind. She stated more than once that he had wanted me to get the sleeping pills from work threatened me, and physically and emotionally abused me when I refused. I tried so hard to save them. Carla took sociology courses through Queen's University, and eventually earned a bachelor's degree in psychology. She participated in every program that was recommended, with the exception of one designed for male sex offenders. She refused to take the course, stating that she was neither male nor a sex offender. As her release date approached, there were mixed opinions on Carla's ability to integrate back into society. Some said that she was violent, manipulative, and a threat to society. In the end, she was deemed fit to be released. Her release was scheduled for July the 4th, 2005. She would have restrictions placed upon her. She was to tell the police her home address, work address, and with whom she was living. She was required to notify police before she moved. She was required to notify the police if she changed her name. If she planned to be away from her home for more than 48 hours, she had to give 72 hours notice. She could not contact Bernardo, whom she was now divorced from, or the families of the victims, including the woman only identified as Jane Doe. She was forbidden to be with people under the age of 16. She could not consume alcohol or drugs other than prescription medication. She was required to continue therapy and counselling. She was required to provide police with a DNA sample. For each stipulation that was broken, she would receive a two-year prison sentence. These restrictions would only stay effective until November 30th, 2005. At that point, a judge ruled that there was not enough evidence to justify them being in place. Carla married her attorney's brother and changed her name to Liana Baudelaire. They have two sons and one daughter together. 
As a final note on Carla's current whereabouts, her past was discovered while she was volunteering at her children's school. The community became outraged. 9,521 citizens were polled. 63.27% believed that they thought they had a right to know where she was at all times, especially if she was around their children. At this moment, there is a petition floating around to add her name and alias to the sex offenders registry. Now to wrap up Paul Bernardo's story. Paul was convicted of two first degree murders and two aggravated sexual assaults on September 1st, 1995. He was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole for a minimum of 25 years. He was designated a dangerous sexual offender, which makes it unlikely that he will ever be released. Paul's time in prison started off with him being placed in a segregation unit at Kingston Penitentiary for his own safety. When he was around other inmates, he was constantly attacked and harassed. He was evaluated by psychiatrists and psychologists who administered a psychological assessment to measure the presence of psychopathy in individuals. Out of a possible 40, he checked off 35 boxes. He was then clinically classified as a psychopath. In 2015, Paul became eligible for day parole in Toronto. He was denied because of his dangerous sexual offender status. His lawyer, Tim Danson, reported that it would be very unlikely for him to be ever granted any level of parole. His latest bid for freedom was in October 2018, where he was once again denied by the Parole Board of Canada. Paul Bernardo and Carla Hamolka were indeed a match made in hell. For images, sources, and a script of this episode, please see the show notes for links. Thanks for watching, until next time.